I've ever kind of prepped for, and God's just kind of like, I got kind of geeked out about this topic, and it really has been a cool thing, and I, what I would say is that this, what we're going to talk about today is central to what we are as a church, what we believe as a church, what we do, and how we do it as a church, and it is central to growing in your faith. This, the idea that we're going to talk about today, it is central to growing in your faith, and if you're ever going to change the world, we have to get what I'm going to talk about today Right. What I want to start with is uh, a passage of scripture. First Corinthians at chapter 12 is where we're going to start. And I will just say this. Stay with me to the end because at the end of this uh, sermon, I've got a specific challenge for you and a specific need for our church. Something that we, as we're going to take the next steps for us as a church, we have a need that, that we need to address. So First Corinthians chapter 12. We're looking at the whole chapter, but I, I'm broke, I break it up so we don't have to read the whole thing. We'll highlight some verses so you'll get the idea of what's being talked about in this chapter. But this is a great place to start. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 12, it says this. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit as to form one body. Everybody say one. one. That word keeps coming up here. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, slave nor free, the beauty of the walk with Christ. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what gender, age, stage. God loves you, wants to do something in you, and you are a part of the one. Everybody say one. one. We were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part but many. But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body Every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now listen to this. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. You're the body of Christ. You're the body of Christ. Each and every one of you are part of it. What I want to talk about this morning is based on the idea of body language. Body language. Before we dive into it, let's pray. Bow our heads, close our eyes, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and I pray that in the next few moments, God, would your spirit move in this place? God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. God, whatever it is that we need to hear, whatever, whatever the thing is, God, I pray that you would challenge us, you would change us. And you would continue to make us into world changers through the blood of Jesus. That we praise you for hope and life in him. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. September 26, 1960 was a pivotal moment in our culture and in our nation's history. And I would say probably the world, uh, history of the world. Uh, September 26 was the date of a presidential debate between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. Now, the thing that made this specific debate important and made it a game-changing moment was this was the first presidential debate that was televised. Up until this point, presidential debates were limited to if you could be at the debate or on the radio or maybe in the newspaper. But this is the first time ever that it was televised. The fascinating thing about this debate is that after the debate took place, polls were taken, just like today, you know, politics is all crazy and stuff, and you hear polls all the time. They were doing that, you know, 50 years ago or 60 years ago. So they took polls. This was the first time ever on TV, about half the nation who were interested in politics watched it on TV. The other half of the nation listened to it on the radio because TV was still, it wasn't quite as mainstay as it would become. So they took polls, and the people that watched it on TV, the majority of people polled who watched the presidential debate on TV, said or felt like John F. Kennedy won the presidential debate. The crazy thing was, is the majority of people who listened to the debate on the radio, they felt like Richard Nixon won the debate. There was something drastically different as to whether or not you saw the person on screen, the people who saw the presence, the body language, everybody say body language, body language. had a different perception of what was communicated. There is something profound about body language, nonverbal communications, people who study communication and connection in between uh, people, um, they generally 
quote the statistic that 93% of communication between two people or three people is nonverbal. So 93% of how we understand each other, how we connect to one another is nonverbal. Think about that for a second. That is crazy. So the words that I'm saying, you're only hearing 7%, right? So everything else is based on what I'm doing. A lot of times we don't think about it. You know, if I got up here and I was like, hey, we need to have church versus this. It's going to connect with you differently. Nonverbal communication is a big deal. And when you think about it, you're like, yeah, absolutely, nonverbal communication. Um, the, think about it uh, in, the, in the context of dogs. Raise your hand if you love dogs. Oh, that's mostly everybody. All right, just to give the other side some, some, some love, raise your hand if you love cats. We'll pray for you. Uh, so we like dog. Dog's man's best friend. One the interesting thing about dogs, they don't really know words and speak and understand English. Now, some really smart breeds can understand some commands and stuff like that. But their primary way of communicating is nonverbal communication, right? They respond to the where you point, to where you, you say come, to how you stand. My dog, Theo, he's a big, uh, he's Doberman mixed with a golden retriever, big, huge black dog. He's kind of scary looking, but he is the, like the biggest sweetheart wimp ever. Um, he, he really is. He just loves to be pet all day. If he could be pet all day, that's what he would do. However, he's really sensitive to uh, nonverbal communication. And so even from when he was a puppy, if, you, if my demeanor changes at all, he would get scared or, or he would uh, respond in a weird way. He's like, I'm, you know, I'm afraid. I don't know, because I would just stand like this or something. He's really sensitive to nonverbal communication. We have a small group at our house. Uh, because he's a lover, he'll just go around person to person to person, let him pet him like all night long as if the whole small group came to see him. But the crazy thing is, is if somebody begins to become emotional, uh, w within the context of being there, he inevitably will pick that up, even from the other room, and he'll go over and he'll lay his head on their lap and just like, oh, I want to. everybody's like, that's the greatest. <laughs> Nonverbal communication. See, what we say, that connects with our minds. Now, even like in, uh, but what we what we do, the, how we, it, it, we see it subconsciously. A dog would see it, but people actually are way more perceptive than dogs. But a lot of times we don't think about it uh, in the moment. It happens in our subconscious. Have you ever been in a room and you're talking to somebody and something was said that the, what they said, the, you know, whatever the, the words they said were pretty innocuous. However, all of a sudden there was like a tension in the room. Right? Have you ever had this? Or you, you start to get the tingles on the back of your neck, or you start to get defensive, or you feel blood rush to your face. What is that? That's nonverbal communication. They are doing something that is setting some alarms off in your brain. Sometimes we would call that an elephant in the room, right? It's nonverbal communication. It is crazy when you think about it. See, what you say is not important necessarily as how you say it. Wives, can I get an Amen. Nonverbal communication. I tell you, I, I really, I mean, I was studying for this, this sermon, and I started to go down this, this rabbit hole of nonverbal, and I just geeked out. It was just fascinating to me how much we respond. You can actually change a room with how you stand. You know, you can change your own mindset by how you stand. People will say, if you just do this for like 30 seconds in the morning, you'll have a better day. If you do this, it's going to be worse. Nonverbal communication it is fascinating to me. Here's the thing. Why are we talking about this in church? You know, we're supposed to be talking about the body of Christ. Here's, here's what it is. <laughs> Nonverbal communication is what, really how we connect. 93% of a communication is nonverbal. So if we're really going to connect with people, with somebody else, whether that's a close friend or wife or kids or whatever, if we're going to connect with people and communicate with people, 93% of it is nonverbal, right? It's not just what we say, what we perceive in our head, but the nonverbal that we actually feel, right? That's what kind of we get in our heart, right? That's true connection and communication. The problem is, in our society, in our culture, in our country, whatever you look at it, communication and connection with people is broken. Right now, we are living in a day and age where it is 
crazy how bad we are at communicating with one another. Now, whether that's a technology thing or a society thing, I would say there's a big, huge spiritual element to that where, uh, if anything, the devil would love for us not to be connected together. But either way you look at it, we have a connection and communication problem. We are not in the room together. Everybody say, in the room. Did you guys see me untie my shoe? That is weird. I've been working on it for a little while. You're in the front row. Everybody else can't see it. All right. We're good. I'm wearing like Mr. Rogers shoes, so they're. We got a, dis- a connection problem. We got a communication problem uh, in our culture. You ever misread a text? <laughs> Everybody was like, amen. Yeah. Somebody said something, and it was, like, totally not a thing. It was, like, something like, oh, I really hope that you come over later. And you're like, what? I can't believe they would ever say, and you get all mad and break up a relationship. We've all been there, right? Why? Because that was in the 7% category. If they had been standing with you and they said, oh, I wish you would have come. You're the the nonverbal communication. You would have connected together, right? Right? It's crazy. Think about it. When it comes to text messaging and uh, how we communicate on Facebook, we've actually gone so far as to make up pictures to simulate body language, right? What are emojis? Pictures to simulate body language. GIFs or GIFs. What is it? Is it GIF or GIF? Raise your hand if you think it's G, GIF. Raise your hand if you think it's G, GIF. Raise your hand if you don't care. All right. Yeah. That's cool. We got a connection problem, a communication problem. All right, that's that's a very long introduction, all right? And it lays a groundwork for what we want to talk about, how we want to unpack it, all right? So I'm going to give you three really quick points, and we're going to dive through and look into God's word together, all right? First point, number one, we're created to be together, and we are better when we are connected together. We're created to be together. All right, we got a problem in our culture. I would say that it's rooted in a sin thing, and it's rooted in the devil would love to not keep us connected. But we were created to be together. You look in the book of Genesis, the story of the creation of the world. God creates the heavens and the earth and the sun and the moon and the stars and the trees and the birds. And at the end of every day, he looks at what he's created, and he says that it's good. He says, this is good, and this is good, and this is good. And then he gets to Adam, and he creates Adam, and he says, it's not good for man to be alone. And so he creates Eve. Ladies, can I get an amen? Amen. He creates Eve. Now, it wasn't just Eve that made it good. It was the fact that Adam and Eve were now two that could be connected and communicate together, that they were part of who they were is to be together. We're created in God's image, and part of God's image is the joy and the process of learning to connect together in a deep way. We're created to be together. You don't even have to look into God's word and talk about that on a spiritual level to know it deep down. I think each and every one of us know, you know deep down that you have a longing to connect with other people. Even if you're an introvert, you have a longing to connect with other people. It's because you're created to do that. While we are struggling as a society to connect together, what we're seeing right now, statistically, is in the areas of depression, anxiety, suicide, all of those are going up and up and up. It's getting worse and worse and worse. And people to study those kind of things, they would say without question, people who are struggling with depression and anxiety almost to a person, they're struggling with the idea of having purpose in their life and the, the idea that they feel, everybody say feel, They feel like they're alone. Feel like they have no purpose, and they feel like they're alone. Even that they're in a crowd of people, but they still feel alone. What is that? They're not connected. They are not experiencing connection. Where the way God created it, designed it to be, is that each and every one of us have a purpose, and part of that purpose is to connect with one another. That's how God designed it. And so there is a tension between what God is calling us to and what the world is trying to pull us towards. The world is trying to make us isolate, pull us away from one another, where God created us to be together. That means, number two on your outline, a key part of being a Christian is growing and being connected together. Key part. If you're going to follow Jesus, if you're going to be a Christian, then major portion of that is that you are growing in your relationships with one another. There's no escaping it. 
learning to connect, communicating, not just with the things you say, but actually being in somebody's presence enough, being in the room. Everybody say in the room. If you're going to actually see the body language, the nonverbal communication, you got to be in the room. you got to experience presence with one another. It's fascinating. This is a little bit of a sidetrack, but I was thinking about Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa is very, very well known. She wasn't known for being an orator or a speaker. What she was known for is that she went to the places where people were sick with things like leprosy and AIDS, the people who were untouchable, who they didn't want other, other people didn't want to be even in their presence. And what she did, she didn't heal them. She sat with them. She touched them. She was just loving to them and lifted their spirits because they were missing out on the connection. And she provided the connection. It's a beautiful thing. The presence, being in the room together. Part of being a Christian is learning to connect with one another. That means that we're supposed to be in the room together. It just means that we're supposed to be growing in our relationship with one another. Jesus was asked, what are the, what's the greatest commandment? If you're going to really follow God, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, I'll sum up the law in two sentences. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. It's not just this way. It's this way as well. You can't miss this. If you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to call yourself a Christian, if you're going to grow in your faith, it's not just this. It's this. It's growing in relationship. So many people think, well, I can believe in God and not go to church. I can pray and all that stuff without going to church. Absolutely you can, but you are not going to grow spiritually. We re- opened up the sermon by reading 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's all about the body of Christ, each and every one of us. And there's an element, as we're talking about connecting to one another, there's an individual element where, you know, pra- Frankly, all of us should probably look at ourselves like, how, do I, how am I connecting with my kids? How am I connecting with my spouse? How am I connecting with my church family? However, it was key. That word that came up again and again in the uh, passage of 1 Corinthians 12 it was one. You're one, but we all form one. So each and every one of us have strengths and gifts and abilities, and God uses us individually with our strengths and weaknesses and gifts and talents and all that stuff, and he pulls us together, and the analogy is a body, like a physical human, like held together by joints and marrow and tissue and fibers that bind us together. We are as one. So there is an individual challenge when it comes to connecting with one another, but there is also a corporate challenge because we are a body. So while if we're going to grow as Christians, we have to work on our connection. If we're going to grow on the church, we need to understand some fundamental ideas about the church. And the first one is number three on your outline, is that the church is not just a building. It's, it's not just a building. It's a body of people growing together spiritually and in love for each other. What's church? It's a body of people growing together spiritually in love for one another. Do you remember this? This is the church. This is the steeple. Open the door and see all the people. You know, our parents taught us that, and maybe we taught it to our kids. Problem is, is that's a lie. (laughs) Everybody's like, what? This is not the church. This is the church. Church is not a building. See, in our vocabulary and vernacular, if you've been to church at any length of time, you've probably heard this and you probably think this, but it's so easy to fall back into the mentality of thinking the church is just a building. Church is not a building. How, many, how often do you ask somebody, where do you go to church? Or do you go to church? As if that was the destination. That's not the church, right? If this building burnt down, you better believe the Medway Church is going to have church. Because this is not the church. This is the church. Are you with me? Raise your hand if you like rock and roll. Yes, second service. First service, there was a whole bunch of people who were like, I don't do that. Um, (laughs) Come on, rock and roll. If uh, you went to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland, Ohio, paid $25 to go in and look at all the cool stuff that's in there, you get to see Michael Jackson's glove, you get to see James Brown's cape, you get to see Elvis Presley's guitar, you get to see Slash's guitar pick, all of this stuff, and you interact and you see the history of rock and roll. When you come out of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, are you a rock star? No, 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 no. Why? Because you just went in and you looked at all the stuff. It was a museum. And you come out and you're the same. If we make church all about a building, 
what we're doing is we're turning it into a Jesus museum where people walk in, they hear some good message, they hear some good history, but then they leave and they're never the same. Or they leave and they're never changed, rather. What we want is for them to leave and never be the same. <laughs> it's a pretty big difference, right? <laughs> when the church is all about a building, we start to argue about pews and altars and crosses and music and stuff like that. The problem is, is when the world sees the church as a building, as a Jesus museum, they walk in and they're not changed. How many people do you know have visited a church and they leave and they're like, ah, just didn't do it for me. I talked to so many people. It's not about the message. They're like, I like the message. Love all people. That's a great message. I, I, I like the idea of, of, of growing in community together. I like the idea of, of singing good songs. They had great music. They'll, they'll like interact with it, but then they say, no, nah, that's not for me. Why? Because it's Jesus Museum. It's one hour a week. You go in and you just see a good thing. We have to constantly be thinking, how do we as a church make sure that we are not about a building? We're not just a Jesus museum. See, when people go and they're turned away from church, they go to a church and they're saying the right things and they're maybe singing the right songs, but the people are turned off or they don't want to come back or they call the church a bunch of hypocrites. The problem is, is that the church as a body is using the wrong body language. Everybody say body language. In the very same way that you can incorrectly communicate somebody, something to somebody you love, even though you said the right words, but it, for some reason, didn't go right because you had weird body language. The very same way the church, I think, so often communicates the right thing with what they say. They say the right message, sing the right songs, do the right ministry, but their body language is wrong. They don't love one another, so when people come, go in and see them, they don't feel like it could be a place that they could call home. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, after it gets done talking about the church being each and every one of us joined together in one body, it goes on to talk about our body language. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says this, If I speak in the tongue of angels or men, but have not love, I am nothing but a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy... And can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. And have a faith that can move mountains but have not love. What are you? Nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor. Body over to hardship that I may boast but do not have love. I am nothing. You can say all the right things. You can do all the right things. You can sing the right songs. You can preach the right sermons. But if you do not have love, it's nothing. Now, sometimes we'll take that verse and we'll read it for us individually. Like I said, there is something to be said about learning to connect with each other individually. Absolutely. But this is talking about the church. It's recognizing, recognizing that when people come into the body of believers, the community of faith, and they don't see them loving one another, that they immediately subconsciously think something's wrong. Jesus told his disciples, the world will know you are my disciples by how you Love each other. How you love each other. See, we are created to be connected together. If we grow as Christians, it means that we're going to grow together. And the church is more than just a building. It's a body. We've got to recognize that growing spiritually with God and growing with one another, it's part of the same coin. Number four on your outline. Just write this in. Growing spiritually and growing in love with each other are two sides of the same coin. It's the same deal, all right? You cannot grow spiritually and not grow in relationships. It doesn't happen. You might get some more knowledge, but that's not growing spiritually. Growing spiritually, I mean, truly growing in Christ means that you're growing in relationship. And if you are truly growing in relationship, they, you are going to point, hopefully, point yourself to Jesus. That's why it's so important you choose who you hang with very wisely doesn't mean you don't hang with people who aren't a Christian, but you better surround yourself with some deep, loving people who will point you back to Jesus because it goes hand in hand. Ephesians chapter 4 talks about the body of Christ and talks about spiritual gifts as well. And it says that if we will learn to love one another, be patient with one another, overcome problems with one another, put in the hard work of being in presence with one another, no matter what, it says... If we do that, then 
we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves. You want to grow spiritually? You got to grow with brothers and sisters in Christ. You got to get connected. If you're going to be truly connected, you got to be in the room together. You got to be communicating, not just 7%, but the whole thing. You got to grow in love. Because ultimately, that's what the world's going to see. Not going to be the message, it's going to be our body language. It's not going to be what the, we sing, it's going to be how we love one another. That's how we change the world, by how we love one another. Number five on your outline, changing the world starts with how you love. Starts with how you love. You know, we said, if you're really going to connect, it's got to be more than what you say. It's how you say it. See, what you say, that, like, that's how you, you think. You know, somebody says something to you, you process it in your mind, but it's the subconscious that picks up your body language. It's kind of how you feel what they feel. It's kind of how it gets in your heart in the very same way. This is what it's all about as a church. What we say, that's the head thing. But what we do, how we love, is the heart thing. It's a subconscious thing that people see. When the church first started, uh, there was a very clear picture of this kind of love for one another. The book of Acts is all about the, the church. It's a narrative story, and it's all about how the church started and how it grew right after Jesus rose from the dead. So, you know, you got the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in your Bible. Those tell the story of Jesus, and then he died on the cross, and then he rose again. And then you get to Acts as like the sequel. And that is what happens to the disciples after Jesus ascends into heaven. And so uh, in Acts chapter 1, it says the Holy Spirit comes down and empowers the disciples. Peter, who was Jesus' number one guy, he preaches a sermon, and like 3,000 people come to faith in Jesus, which is a beautiful and awesome thing. That's what we want. They're changing the world. Then they start the church, formal, the church of which we are still a part, the gathering, the people, the body. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47, there is a picture, a description of what the church looked like. And this is uh, the description of what the church still is called to look like. And let me read it for you. Starting in verse 22, it says this. They have devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. They devoted themselves to apostles' teaching. Oh, it goes on to say, every day they continued to meet in the temple courts, broke bread in their homes, praising God. Uh, and then the end, the, the Lord added to their number daily. People all around were coming to know Jesus. The world was being changed. Their brothers who they've been praying for to know Jesus were coming to know Jesus. Their neighbors who they've been praying for to come to know Jesus were coming to know Jesus. They were being added to daily. That is crazy. Think about the energy, about the movement of God happening in that place. Why? What were they doing? What did it look like? What was the body language? It says they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to prayer, to breaking of bread and to fellowship were the four things that were listed in those first couple of verses. First, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. What the apostles were teaching was the message of the gospel of Jesus. It was this. This is what Jesus did. This is how it fulfilled the law. It was basically what we read in our scriptures. So the word of God, that's what they were devoted to, teaching the word of God, to prayer. Learning to pray to God, to be together. It was this relationship. So as a church, they were devoted to growing together spiritually. Read your Bible, pray. For us, we in our plan for spiritual growth, read your Bible, pray every day. That's this relationship. Work on your devotional time with God. They were devoted to it. Then they were devoted to fellowship. Fellowship is, uh, comes from a Greek word called koinonia. That word translates, we translate it simply as fellowship. Sometimes, though, we maybe miss what true fellowship means. What that was referring to is, is basically being of the same mind. It's like being on a sports team. You have a common goal, different people, different roles, different strengths. It doesn't mean you always love, like each other. Sometimes you get in fights and stuff, but your common purpose unites you for a goal, right? That's fellowship. That's koinonia. It's very much like a body, right? A body with many different parts and skill sets. A physical body. That's fellowship. They were devoted to their mission. 
their common purpose, which was to change the world, to reach the world for Christ. And then it says they were devoted to the breaking of bread. Now, if you read some commentaries, some scholars try to uh, point that that might have meant communion. You know, like when we take communion together, that breaking of bread meant when we take communion together. However, most scholars, you know, point to the language of that, and it actually says this again a couple verses later. Actually, that probably just means eating together. It just means eating together. So they were devoted to growing like this. They were gro- devoted to prayer and, and the word. They were devoted to fellowship, their mission, and then they were devoted to eating together. Now, sometimes, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I think about uh, like the early church or maybe the church or Christians in general, and I, I feel like we, I get this kind of haze in my mind that uh, everything that they do is going to be super churchy, right? Like, so they are like, eat, so they broke bread in their homes, and my picture is like Amazing Grace is playing in the background, and a lot of, a lot of like, here, thou's, and this, or thither's, as they're eating this thing, where the reality was, chances are good, that just meant that they were hanging out, they were eating food, talking about how bad the Bengals were, right? <laughs> That's it. They're just, they're in the room. Everybody say, in the room. <laughs> they're interacting with one another. They're learning to love one another. Something special about eating together, isn't there? Something intimate about sharing a meal. It's crazy. We talked about the connection problem, the communication problem that we have in our society. That's not a new thing. It's really fascinating. You look at architecture in our country. If you go prior to about 1955 or 1960 and look at homes, how were homes built? Giant front porch, big living room where you could gather together, dining room, big kitchen. That The whole house was set up so that you could interact with your neighbors and bring people in and then just talk to one another, be in each other's presence. If you go into a home today, there's no front porch. The living room is kind of small, centered around a TV. The kitchen is non-existent. If you have a dining room, nobody goes in there. But the master bedroom is huge. Isn't that crazy to think about? Left to our own devices, we want to try to isolate as opposed to learning to grow together and love one another. To actually be in presence, to eat together. That's what the disciples did. That's what the church looked like when people saw them. They saw people who were committed to God and growing, but they saw people who were committed to being connected and love one another. And it was a beautiful thing and it's an attractive thing and that is how the world sees Jesus. It's how we love. It's a big deal to understand how we love one another matters. How we're connected to one another matters. Now, I said this in the last service, and it just, I don't know. I I think they got it, but it's a little dangerous. But when we say how we love one another, I think sometimes it's easy to be like in the I love you, man, kind of way, right? Kind of surfacey. What I said in the last service was like the Yellow Springs kind of way, which was like, I love you, man, you know, Uh, and then some people were like, I'm from Yellow Springs, and I'm like, I don't mean it bad, I just mean that, we're talking about practical, yeah, my body language is weird, (laughs) now I'm talking about, what's it mean to love one another, it means that you are in the room together, you are growing in fellowship, you are growing in just finding out about each other, what are your needs? What are your desires? What are, how, how do you communicate? The other 93%, that's loving one another. That's when the church is most attractive. That's when people come in, and it's not just a Jesus museum. It's how you love. That's what our call is as, a, as Christians and as a church, is to love one another deeply. So the challenge is, is how do we do that? How do we have the right body language as a church and as individuals? How do we do it? we got to work at it. They devoted themselves. Everybody say devoted. devoted. They devoted themselves. They worked at it, right? Sometimes it's hard to read your Bible every day, isn't it? Stuff gets in the way. Sometimes it's hard to have a good devotional life where you pray because stuff gets in the way. But you try and you try and you try. Sometimes it's hard to be on mission. Sometimes it's hard to love one another. Amen? Amen. But when we do, when we love one another, when we learn to overcome stuff, we start to step in to the description that 1 Corinthians 13 goes on to say. After it talks about the body and having the right body language, it defines love like this. Love is patient. Love is kind keeps no record of wrongs, it always hopes, it always perseveres, it always protects. 
that kind of love, when we learn to love each other like that, if you're going to be patient with somebody, you've got to be in the room, be in presence with them. You've got to overcome some stuff. If we love one another like that, what we're doing is we're showing the love of Jesus to them because that's exactly how Jesus loves you and me. Jesus is the display of God being kind with you, keeping no record of wrong with you, protecting you. See, sometimes I think people think God is this big bad meanie up in heaven that wants to just smite you down for all the bad stuff you've done. When the fact of the matter is, he's kind and patient. He keeps no record of wrongs. As a matter of fact, he sent Jesus. He demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He wanted to wipe that all away. That's how much God loves you. Jesus came to die to give you hope and give you life. He came to restore this relationship he also came to restore this relationship. That's our call as a church. That's how we show Jesus to the world. So we got to figure out how do we make that work. So for us at Medway Church, if you rewind the, about 15 years ago, our church looked very different. And if you've been to our church for a little while, you might know the story. If not, uh, 15 years ago, this church was nearly dead. There was only 50 people at our church, give or take. And the average age was they were really... Um, Let's just say they watched the 1960 debate on television, okay? <laughs> Average age is really old, not a lot of kids. There were a stack of people who were desperate to see God move, and so they prayed and prayed and prayed. God brought Pastor Mike here, and a movement of God happened. It was a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so we uh, have seen God grow us and grow us and grow us. We changed buildings, all kinds of stuff like that. So now we get the opportunity, Pastor Mike and the staff and I, we get the opportunity to talk to other churches. And they'll ask, well, how did it happen? How did God grow your church? And so, you know, we've, over the years, you know, God really did it. You know, it was just the spirit of God. And they're like, yeah, but really, how did it actually happen? Um, we're like, yeah, actually God moved. But the practical thing, what it looked like for us is we had people praying that God would move, that they were desperate and willing to do anything to, to grow the church. God used those as a foundation. They were, they were superheroes. They still are superheroes. And then Pastor Mike came. God gave him the leadership gifts and anointed him to take us and point us to being external. So we, were, we got on mission, right? So people, we very much like Acts 2, we started to focus on God, and we started to focus on our fellowship, our mission of reaching the world for Christ. And then... Pastor Mike had come out of a church that was doing what we call small groups. Pastor Mike was, uh, had grown a ton in his small groups, so he told our church, church, we're going to go and get new people for Christ, but we're going to do small groups together. And so we set up about a year into uh, the transition. Pastor Mike said, you know what, we're going to do small groups. Everybody's like, we don't even know what that is. What's a small group? He says, well, it's just People gathering together in their homes, very much like Acts 2. We're just a smaller group. Can't do the whole church. Just a couple people in the room together. Everybody say in the room. <laughs> you eat together. You fellowship together. You look into God's word together. You pray together. You challenge one another. You just bear one another's burdens. Just go for it. The church said, okay. We had people who had never led small groups, who never thought they would lead a small group. They stepped up. They were willing to take a chance. And so small groups started. And our church began to grow like crazy. And those people in the small groups were growing like crazy. And the leaders were growing like crazy. And it grew and grew and grew. And as our church has continued to grow in our influence and in our reach, I would say the, probably the most important part, the central piece to us growing is our small groups. It's us working on the together. We recognize that our ha a major part of our call as Christians is to grow that relationship. And so we took it as a responsibility to grow. And so we've devoted ourselves to it. And the primary way we do that is through small groups. That's how God's moved in this place. From a practical challenge standpoint, absolutely. We've, sometimes it's hard. But I would say from a personal standpoint, I look back at my time at Medway Church, the biggest steps in growth that I've taken have happened through my small group biggest of impacts in my wife and I's family's life has happened through our small groups. Our best friends happen in our small groups. It has been, made the difference for us in just our lives. You talk to anybody here who's been a part of a small group, you probably will hear stories of how they are here because of their small group. Or maybe get, they felt like their life was saved by their small group, right? They, it is, it means so much, so much from a challenge standpoint, but also from a, hey, you want to experience God in his fullest, you need to be in a small group. So the challenge, challenge for us 
It's simple. Get in a small group. Get in a small group. I don't know if you've been here for any length of time. We say it all the time. If you want to grow spiritually, read your Bible, pray every day, come to church regularly, serve, get in a small group. The reason we do it is because it's how we connect. It's how we get our body language right so that the world sees. So if you're not in a small group, sign up, plug in, get going. You could sign up on our app. You can come see us at guest services. I would challenge you, take a step. If you've only been coming for a couple of weeks, you don't have to wait. There's no time frame. Sign up. Be a part of it. I'm telling you, God will move in you. I will say this. we got a huge number of people. You know, if you feel challenged, oh, I want to take that step. Awesome. Just be very careful. There's so there's a lot of moving parts. If you don't get called right away, we do our very best to call within a couple days. But if you sign up and it's hard to get into, be devoted to it. Don't give up. Keep trying. Follow up with us. Don't be mad. Just follow up with us because we, we do. We desperately want to get you connected because that how, is how God's going to grow you. And that's how we're going to change the world. And I told you at the beginning I was going to hit you up with a need. We, need, we have a massive need for us as a church. And it's always good to just communicate so they're all on the same page. We have so many people that are new and coming to our church, and we've recognized that God has grown our church basically as, with small groups as our heartbeat. Right now we have almost 40 groups, small groups, which is awesome. That's, uh, yeah, it's great. But we only have about half of our people in a small group right now. I'm challenged, I would love for us to get everybody into small groups because that's how we're going to grow. But in order to do that, we need small group leaders, right? We have about 40 groups. My group, just as an example, my group has 23, 24 people in it in my tiny little living room. we got to leak into my giant master bedroom. <laughs> we got a whole bunch of little kids. We, we, we'll ro- run out of space. We need small group leaders. We need people who are willing to take a step to let God use them. Some of you have been small group leaders in the past. You've taken a break. Man, we need you again. Some of you have been hesitant to take the step. You're thinking, oh, I need to have a theological degree. You don't. We've set it up in such a way where it's easy as anything. We have curriculum provided. All you got to do is get in the room with people and try to learn to love each other. That's really what it is. If you've been hanging out for any length of time, you've been going to church for a while, we need people to step up and be small group leaders. Maybe if you're thinking, I don't know that I could ever be a leader, but you got a house and you're hospitable, we need people to host small groups. We've got some leaders that don't have the space to do it. If that is you, either one of those things, God may be pressing on your heart to be a part of that, to help us with that. Come see us at guest services. Sign up online. Let us know. We need it. We need to get plugged into small groups, and we need leaders. That's going to make our church irresistible to the world. That's going to help us change the world. That's how we're going to take the message of God to not just be something we hear with our heads, but actually we feel with our hearts, and it is going to change the world. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray, God, that you would make us an irresistible church. God, you would make us a church with the right body language.